So uh, now we'll move on to the next talk uh, by uh, Dr. Mossad Al Hamza about uh, carotid endotrichotomy. I'd like to first thank uh, the, the uh, organizing committee for inviting me to this uh, to this um, meeting to participate and kind of talk about the carotid endotrichotomy, which is an operation that. Uh, I hope most of us are familiar with, expert with, and, and, and love it, uh, as we should, and, um, and also touch base on the indications and, and the, some of the anatomical uh, stuff that we discussed, and also hopefully have a discussion um, about the indications of both procedures uh, and have a, a great discussion at the end with Dr. Spears and everyone um, in, the, in the panel. Um, so thank you all again. Um, I'm going to try to go in less than 20 minutes, hopefully. Um, I don't have relevant disclosure, except that I love doing the case, and I don't do enough of them, uh, and I don't think I should be doing um, a lot of them um, for, for a lot of reasons that we'll be discussing. Um, so I was asked to speak about carotid and dardorectomy, and I'll just touch base on the uh, quick epidemiology um, of the surgery, uh, of its indications, uh, some of the preoperative evaluations and operative techniques that we um, we all uh, know and do. And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the perioperative stroke management complications, as well as some results and trends uh, that Dr. Spears had already touched on a few um, um, on a few of them um, already. As you'll know, uh, carotid neurodectomy or carotid uh, disease was identified really in the early um, 19th century, um, where uh, angiographic images show the occlusions or disease of uh, uh, extracranial uh, carotid artery. But the first attempt to actually treat that was done in the 1950s. And then it was widely adopted in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, uh, as, as a preventive tool really of uh, disabling stroke and death. Uh, and after the publications of the landmark uh, trials in the 90s, it, it drove the adoption really uh, up for, especially for symptomatic patients. Uh, but then at the early um, years of the 20, uh, sorry, in the 20, um, 21st century, um, the, the entire um, trend went down for all interventions. And it's, it's, it's because of the improvement of uh, the medical therapy, but as well as questioning some of the risks and the indications of the procedures. Uh, this is an example of what you can see uh, in the uh, US Medicare data uh, over the years from the early 21st uh, century. You can see that the entire um, carotid interventions are going down. And there are similar data as well uh, from the Canadian institutions as well as European data. Um, the indications, as you all know, for uh, carotid endotrichotomy are most symptomatic patients with a moderate to severe stenosis, and it depends on which criteria you're using in your, uh, in your lab. Um, it should also be considered, uh, and this is, this is a very, very, uh, I put it in red because it's a very red question here, to be considered in asymptomatic patients uh, with moderate to severe stenosis. Uh, at whom their perioperative stroke and death rate is really below 3% and whom you expect uh, their life expectancy to, to basically um, exceed five years. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on that. These are, as what Dr. Spears mentioned and, and presented, uh, these are adopted by a variety of societies of different disciplines. Um, this is a great diagram that's mentioned in the European Society of Vascular Surgery Guidelines uh, a couple of years ago. The, the uh, blue side is the asymptomatic and the, the red side is the symptomatic um, cases in the past six months. It basically tells you that the moderate uh, to severe uh, disease needs to be, uh, that symptomatic really needs to be offered. And as you see the class 1A recommendation is a carotid and directomy and best uh, medical therapy. And uh, an alternative to that as a, as a uh, carotid artery stenting should be considered if high uh, risk for carotid endarterectomy or may be considered in some other circumstances. And we'll touch, bit, we'll touch on that as well. Um, the preoperative evaluation is extremely important to be standardized. This is just the general consensus of the NASET criteria and duplex. And the first thing we look at is the, um, the left uh, hand side uh, column of the diameter reduction or the degree of stenosis, which corresponds to the velocities that we measure uh, in duplex, but also uh, 
at one of the things that we look at is the is the ICA over CCA ratio, and anything to or above is basically indicative of moderate to severe stenosis. And with that, we just go ahead and try to evaluate the patient for a procedure. Um, this has its own limitations, especially if there's a high thrombus burden at the bulb, uh, where an asset. Uh, criteria really becomes a bit uh, of, of an unuseful, unuseful here, and we need to use other criteria. Uh, however, some labs use their own locally adopted uh, criteria that have been validated against NASA or e ACSD or other criteria that are well established. Um, what if duplex is not enough? Uh, what if there is some other uh, issues with duplex, like we don't really know the anatomy around it, or there's a high risk uh, um, anatomical um, uh, variables uh, like a redo neck surgery or radiated neck or some other um, uh, bony or fibrous abnormality. Uh, that's probably where you need to have another imaging modality um, such as CTA or MRA. MRA seems to be the very, very sensitive study um, over all of them, but they also somehow tend to overestimate the degree of stenosis compared to CTA, which may underestimate it sometimes, but they're all used uh, generally, um, these days, is non-invasive tests to try to complement each other and help in the preoperative evaluation. Conventional angiography is done only in, in very limited, I would say, in very limited um, um, instances right now, um, it, especially in asymptomatic patients uh, who don't need thrombectomy since it's a very invasive procedure and the results of it or the, the values that you get of it could probably be uh, achieved uh, through CTA most of the time. Um, I'll touch base on the operative technique, and I'm sure the, um, many of the audience here are, are expert in, in carotid and Um I'll talk about the choice of anesthesia and what we know about it, the position and decision, the conventional or eversion techniques um, for, for the repair itself, uh, uh, as well as the intraoperative monitoring and the use of shunts um, with the closure and completion uh, imaging that are done either intraoperatively or perioperatively. Um, to start with the choice of anesthesia, um, it really is variable. Uh, there are people, it depends on where you're trained or where you practice or what your institution adopts, which I could see that in, in a large part of North America, um, general anesthesia is very well adopted, uh, while local or regional anesthesia is adopted more in European countries. Um, there have been a GALA trial collaborative, a GALA study that was published in 2008, and I believe our institution was part uh, of that. Uh, and it really showed that there's no major difference in hemodynamic uh, changes or cardiac events or stroke or death as, as a major outcome uh, for these studies. And so, um, you know, anyway, uh, each either way you're doing, uh, as long as you're comfortable and good with it and good at it, uh, it's probably the way to go. Um, as for the operative technique, uh, because of because it's the neck, it's it's an extremely uh, dangerous but a beautiful place to operate on. Uh, the position is usually the flex trunk with the head tilted away. Um, if the patient is awake, you probably want to put a Mayo stand just to uh, remove the, the, the uh, drapes um, from your face. The standard versus transverse incisions are adopted. The standard ones are the longitudinal ones along the anterior border of the sternomastoid, while the transverse ones are along the crease. Um, they provide some cosmetic um, uh, benefits, uh, but might be challenging in some exposure, especially in high exposure and high uh, lesions. Um, the superior end of the uh, dissection, you, you should end up at the digastric muscle, superior of the digastric muscle, while the inferior end down at the omohyoid. Um, we, uh, as vascular surgeons, tend to carefully uh, try to identify vagus as the first thing and then go up and try to identify the hypoglossal. Uh, we also sometimes um, find the ansem are very meticulous and careful with it. Um, and I won't lie when I say that I almost had a heart attack when I was operating with a neurosurgeon who just cut it in front of my eyes and said, just don't worry about it. Um, and so maybe, maybe uh, you guys are more comfortable with it than I am. Um, the um, part of, of the repair itself is the conventional standard longitudinal lesion, uh, longitudinal arteriotomy that starts from the bulb all the way up to the internal carotid artery, preferably to be away from the origin of the external uh, carotid just to have the repair to be a lot easier. This is the diagram where the shunt is actually in place, where the um, uh, plaque is removed carefully and, and, and make sure that it's tethered distally and removed as you see in the right hand um, side picture. 
and that uh, that um, um, arteriotomy is actually closed with a patch, as you see here. This is as opposed to the E version in the arterectomy uh, model. I think this was introduced by Michael DeBakey uh, initially, uh, but I think the neurosurgeons have become very proficient in it early on uh, before they, uh, you know, most of it were handed out, were handed over to us. Um, they basically control or the vessels open the um, or excise uh, the, the uh, uh, origin of the internal carotid artery and just peel all the, um, the plaque from it, then do a formal endarterectomy of the, of the bulb itself, uh, which will allow you to do a quick reanastomosis or reattachment. Uh, it's also very useful if you have a kinked or a long internal carotid artery where you can trim some of it and, and cut it to length and stout and, and reattach it with a wide anastomosis that is less prone to, to re-stenosis. Uh, patching can be difficult. Uh, it's not really, uh, sorry, shunting can be difficult here. Uh, it's not very prohibitive, prohibitive, but it can be difficult and time consuming if you're not familiar with it. Uh, and it also, as a disadvantage, it requires more extensive dissection of the vessels um, that you probably don't need with the with the standard uh, endarterectomy. Uh, the last thing that is very important here is the distal ICA flap might be difficult to visualize even with a full uh, E version. Um, one would ask what was the difference between the E version or the conventional carotid endarterectomy, and the answer to that is probably no major differences detected if you're comfortable with either technique. The only thing that was uh, uh, observed really is that eversion technique was associated with some lower, uh, a little bit of lower rates of restenosis on the long run. And that's probably related to, um, you know, degree of the patch or the intimal hyperplasia that is usually developing uh, in some of the arterial repairs sites. Um, the Intraoperative monitoring or the use of shunt uh, is a very controversial thing and people are, tend to be very religious about it. Uh, many people, especially uh, early on, were non-shunters and used to be and continue to be non-shunters. And in the, in the GALA trial, I believe less than 10% of the operators were non-shunters. Uh, most of the people who operate globally are, are routine shunters these days. As you get comfortable um, operating on the carotid artery, uh, some people uh, tend to be selective shunters and they use you know, shunts uh, depending on what, uh, what they see intraoperatively. Uh, the, the, those folks uh, either do a stump pressure by essentially occluding the um, common uh, carotid or clamping the common carotid and having an art line uh, tubing in with, it, with a catheter insert in the internal to determine the stump pressure. And if they're happy with it, then they just go on without shunting. Uh, some of them adopt the transcutaneous Doppler uh, uh, detection of flow in the uh, middle cerebral artery, uh, which somehow showed that the results of the, 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 the instance of strokes was approaching 5%. I think they're just seeing some debris and stuff the more they, the more they clamp or manipulate, but the clinical effect of that uh, was not really reported much. The evoked potential recording is employed at the somatosensory ones where they put some needles in the hands and legs and feet to detect if there is any drop uh, in that. Uh, where they, they would have to insert the shunt. Or uh, for those folks who use it under local anesthesia, essentially when the patient starts to have symptoms, they would probably go ahead and shunt it. Uh, these are the two major types of shunts, either a straight one, the Javit shunt, or the, um, or the, um, uh, the other one that, that's uh, basically turned around and more versatile one, which is a Pruitt and a Hara one. Um, it's, uh, they're both are, um, are good for use. Uh, many people are using uh, either or. The Javit shunt is, I think, used with some uh, or associated with some a little bit more flap or some dissections that are minor uh, while using it. But that's not been very very uh, different from the uh, the uh, Bruit and Har shunt. As for the closure, which is a very very important. Um, um, uh, I'm sorry, the stroke rate for routine shunters. Uh, uh, is 2%, sorry, that's, these numbers are opposite, I'm sorry about that. The routine shunters has a 1.4% uh, stroke rates, preoperative stroke rates compared to the non-shunters who were, um, who had a 2% um, stroke rates. Uh, I'm sorry, again, that's that's the opposite. As for the closure, uh, early on the primary, the, the arteriotomy was closed primarily and a longitudinal uh, arteriotomy that's closed primarily will definitely lead to stenosis and probably re-stenosis of the lesion versus patch or eversion. As we know, eversion now uh, has a lower rate of re-stenosis even compared to a patch. 
Uh, these two modalities uh, have lower perioperative stroke and death rates compared to uh, primary arteriotomy closure. And that's why it's probably standard of care right now uh, to uh, close uh, the arteriotomy with patch uh, if you're using the standard technique. Uh, then uh, we'll talk about the completion imaging in the uh, in the uh, at the end of the procedure. Uh, usually, when we close and uh, unclamp and reestablish flow to that part of the brain, we examine that with a Doppler uh, uh, to, to detect the si signal approximately and distally, and make sure everything is okay. Sometimes we're not quite sure if we try to bring duplex, but it's also um, uh, operator dependent, uh, and I, I can tell you that um, surgeons vascular surgeons uh, are not very expert in actually performing duplex uh, themselves uh, without proper training. Um, that's the most common modality we use as a completion uh, angiogram. Uh, the, angi and the angiography is, is, is very rarely used and I've, I think it's been abandoned now just because of the, of the uh, positioning of the patient and the difficulty of doing it. Uh, and most of the time currently it's done through the same incision by inserting small catheter in the common carotid artery. And the question becomes really when to reopen if you see something, if you see a small uh, dissection flap, or if you see a floater, or you see a little thrombus, when do you really open, especially if the patient is under general anesthesia? And that takes us to the perioperative stroke management. Um, when a uh, patient develops uh, uh, symptoms uh, under local anesthesia after closure of the, uh, of the artery, uh, then the decision is really easy to reopen and explore it right away uh, to make sure that there is no flap and there is no um, acute thrombus forming in the area. Uh, if the patient is under GA, we usually stay scrubbed until the confirmation of the neurological status when the patient emerges from anesthesia and make sure that they, they uh, move the contralateral uh, side of their body and they don't have major uh, deficits in their cranial nerves as well. Um, sometime, uh, very rarely when they have those deficits uh, and they're very clear, we tend to go back and reopen right away. Uh, the, these, these questions are kind of easier compared when, uh, to when the, the uh, symptoms or the deficits actually develop in the recovering room, it becomes more challenging. And uh, if, if, if available, uh, we can do a quick duplex exam to just rule out acute thrombosis of the area uh, of the operative site, which might be difficult given the, the recent decision. Uh, and therefore, uh, the differential diagnosis could be just a transient ischemia due to the clamp or embolization uh, or some other factors, and we tend to anticoagulate them right away um, and sometimes take them to the CT scan if we're not sure if the cause of that, uh, if the cause of, of the symptoms is actually thrombosis. Uh, of the area. Uh, I'll touch base on the complications uh, in general, and uh, I just rem remind myself and everyone that the goal of carotid endarterectomy or carotid stenting is to prevent future strokes, so it's primarily a quality of life uh, procedure or procedures that we're doing. Uh, the major complications that have been, especially in the contemporary trials, the major adverse uh, cardiovascular outcomes and uh, as Dr. Spears touched on them, there are MI, stroke, or death, and stroke is usually uh, uh, re-stratified or subgrouped into epsilateral stroke or immediate stroke or either temporal or site uh, of stroke uh, stratification. MI is the cause of death in about 25 or 50% of cases after carotid endarterectomy, and that's why even in the CREST trial, um, uh, despite the, the, um, the uh, objection, I would say, from the vascular surgeons that the, the results are not the same. It's hard to say that just troponitis is not a, a predictor of uh, increased mortality down the road. Um, the other complications are related to the surgery itself or the site of surgery, the cranial uh, nerve injuries that could happen between, anywhere between 5 to 20 percent. And the reason of that uh, is simply because we have nerves everywhere around uh, the area. Most of them is the hypoglossal uh, nerve uh, uh, palsy, and most of them are temporary. Uh, the cerebral hyperperfusion syndrome is the is the uh, killer. Uh, it happens five uh, about five or seven days afterwards. It's a rare, but the mortality could uh, exceed seventy percent. And we have to really do a CT to rule out a bleed. And if there is, we have to call the good guys, the neurosurgeons, to uh, to help the patient with that. Hemodynamic instability is very common, and that's why uh, continuous monitoring for the first 24 hours is very, very important for these patients. Uh, as you all know, the results are extremely um, um, 
fantastic really for symptomatic disease from the NASA trial and ECSD. The asymptomatics remain controversial. The pooled analyses uh, showed that you know you just need to treat six patients to prevent an event in severe stenosis symptomatic patients. The asymptomatic patients, despite uh, the progression, it still favors the uh, uh, carotid endarterectomy when it comes to, uh, to treatment and meta-analysis. Uh, and these are the contemporary uh, results. And as Dr. Spears mentioned, uh, the results earlier, I'm not gonna go again on them, but as you can see, the stroke and death rates uh, tend to be higher with the stenting and more MI uh, with endarterectomy. Uh, the ACT1 trial, which was published at the same day of the 10-day CREST results, uh, it was a non-inferior trial and had its own methodological problems as well, but it showed that it's non-inferior in asymptomatic disease. Um, these are the results from the Ontario um, uh, real-world uh, follow-up in 13 years, and you could still see that the uh, carotid artery uh, carotid artery vascularization, uh, carotid endarterectomy tend to be severe across the board. And the main, really, as what Dr. Spears mentioned, the main drop of stenting happens really in the perioperative area, and then it just becomes parallel uh, throughout uh, as we go further in, in follow-up. Uh, and so CREST2 is hopefully going to um, answer a very important question, especially about asymptomatic patients, whether or not we should actually do anything to them. And we look forward to the results of, of this trial. Uh, in summary, uh, I would say that carotid endarterectomy is a durable procedure with an established fantastic benefits in treating symptomatic carotid lesions. And careful selection of asymptomatic patients is key. Uh, and further research is ongoing in CREST2 and others just because in the real world, we know now that most of the operators, regardless of what they're doing, is stenting or carotid endarterectomy, they, they don't really reach the benchmark of 3% risk of stroke or uh, perioperative stroke. And that's why the selection, that, that, that we have to be careful in selecting these patients. Alternative to carotid endarterectomy, whether it's stenting or best medical therapy, should be considered in, in patients with prohibitive risk. And transcervical carotid um, artery vascularization, or TCAR, showing superior results versus transfemoral approach in registries data, is, uh, at, uh, at least recent, at least uh, in the time being. And I don't think we will see any randomized trials comparing both of them. Uh, but I think it's a TCAR is a very, very uh, great technology and advancement uh, that combines both the surgical uh, and the endovascular techniques. And I think we all of us should be, um, you know, getting to know this and, and uh, experience, experiment, experimenting and actually studying this uh, further to determine uh, what would be the best modality in treating our patients. Um, these are just some of the selected references, and I'd like again to thank the uh, the moderators and the um, and my colleagues here at the university for inviting me uh, to this talk.